your patience there. Thank you for joining us for the final webinar of our Spotlight series on patient reported measures. My name's Sarah Ely, and I'm the Senior Project Officer Capacity Building at Health Translation SA, and I've been your host for this series. So I want to start by acknowledging that the Ghana people are the traditional custodians of the Adelaide region, which my feet are on here in Adelaide. I recognise their cultural, spiritual, physical and emotional connection to the land. I honour and pay my respects to Ghana elders, past, present and into the future. And I imagine a lot of us are in Ghana land, but if you'd like to pop into the chat where you're from, then please do. So briefly, the, the Spotlight series, it's an initiative that Health Translation SA launched in 2021, and it's a way of building knowledge and capacity in a range of essential research translation skills and topics which might not be well understood. And we do this through a month-long education initiative, and part of that is the is this series of four webinars. So today we've run Spotlight series in the areas of implementation science, research impact, community engagement, the MRFF and health economics. And these previous uh, series can be accessed from the Health Translation SA website. And for this one on patient reported measures, we've been pleased to co-host this with the Commission on Excellence and Innovation in Health. And they're the lead agency for innovation in healthcare in South Australia. So they focus on bringing consumers, clinicians and other collaborators together to turn ideas into better healthcare. And if you want to know more about them, I encourage you to visit their website. And Health Translation SA, for anyone who's not familiar, we're an NHMRC accredited research translation centre. We offer a collaborative cross-sectorial approach to research and enabling translations of findings into improved patient care. So essentially, we seek to connect health researchers and health services with the right stakeholders and partners to accelerate the implementation of research discoveries. And you can see down the bottom here, we have 11 partners, and these are academic and research and healthcare agencies, so that they're really encompassing the breadth of health delivery across South Australia. And our vision is to accelerate the translation of research findings into to improve the healthcare of South Australians. We work with our partners and other stakeholders as an independent catalyst and broker to mobilise collaborations and address major health system challenges. We do this through a range of ways, which you can see in this diagram, but one of them being education and training, which is where the Spotlight series falls into. So today, like I said, it's the final webinar in our Spotlight series on PRMs. And we're discussing um, PREMS in action. So that's practical examples of patient reported measures being implemented in various ways. And to discuss this, we're gonna hear from Renee and Wendy Saunders, or Renee Taylor and Wendy Saunders, both from Adelaide PHN, Tamara Crittenden from Salen and Flinders Medical Center, and Claudia Verdun from Queensland University of Technology. So each of the presentations will go for about 15 minutes. And at the end, we'll have about 15 minutes of Q&A. So feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat or Q&A throughout, and we'll get to them at the end of the session. So we were gonna start with Renee and Wendy, but I might just mix it up because they, so that we can sort out the IT glitches. So Tamara, I'm sorry for just dropping you in this. I hope this is okay. Um, but I might ask Dr. Tamara Crittenden, who will speak to speak first on PROMS in Plastic Surgery, the Practice of Evidence-Based Medicine. And Tamara is a medical scientist and clinical research coordinator in the Salen Department of Plastics and Reconstructive Surgery at Flinders Medical Centre. Since 2012, Tamara has been responsible for coordinating clinical research activities across several key areas of the specialty, including reconstructive breast surgery, head and neck cancer, cleft lip and palate, skin cancer and hand surgery. The primary focus of these projects is the collection and interpretation of evidence to support continuous improvement. So Tamara, if you're happy to jump in, I'm going to hand the screen over to you to share, please. Perfect. Thank you very much. Can you see that okay? That's all good. Brilliant. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, today I'll be presenting a snapshot of the different ways that our plastic reconstructive surgery department have used patient reported outcome measures or PROMs over the past 15 years. 
Uh, before I begin my presentation today, I'd just like to let you know in advance that I will be showing some clinical photographs relating to breast cancer management that may cause distress to some people. I'd like to acknowledge that I'm presenting from the traditional lands of the Ghana people today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that acknowledgement to other Aboriginal peoples, peoples who are joining us today. So in surgery, the traditional measures of outcome are from the perspective of the hospital or the doctor and focus on factors such as rate of, rate of complications, length of hospital stay and number of deaths. And there is often very little distinction between different types of compl complications and nobody asks the patient whether the complication was important to them. In plastic surgery, the, the surgeon often takes photographs and will make a judgment about the success of surgeries from these. But again, this is from the medical perspective and disregards the fact that the patient may have a very different goal or perspective. So while it is important to measure complications and death rates, only measuring the presence or absence of these does not give a very complete picture of outcome. From the patient's perspective, they often assume the doctor will try and protect them from complications and death. Their focus is often more on understanding how the surgery is gonna impact their lives. And PROMs are increasingly becoming recognized as an important part of clinical practice worldwide for including the patient's voice and for capturing quality of life outcomes. And this is of particular importance uh, in specialties such as reconstructive surgery, where the aim of procedures is often to improve or restore function and to improve a patient's quality of life. And this is a quote from a paper in a recent issue of the Medical Journal of Australia, which I think this summarises the importance of collecting the patient perspective through PROMs quite nicely. And we strongly support the statement that including the patient's voice is critical for shared decision-making decision and for providing patient-centred care. So over the past 15 years or so, our unit have integrated a selection of both generic and condition-specific PROMs into clinical care across several key areas of this specialty to support continuous improvement activities and also in the practice of evidence-based medicine with the aim of delivering better outcomes for our patients. And in this presentation, I'll provide examples from some of these projects. So integrating PROMs in our service has enhanced patient-centered care. And we use this information in several ways for individual patient care, uh, to audit the clinical management of patients within our service, to compare outcomes with other organizations to evaluate standards of practice, and also for research and for patient advocacy. And I'll start off with some examples of individual patient care. So one example of how we use PROMs for ind individual patient care is if within the Flinders Breast Reconstruction Service. So this would be the traditional surgical perspective on a woman who has had a breast removed for cancer. The patient had no complications, she was alive and well, and she had a neat scar. But this is the patient perspective. For example, every time I look in the mirror or have a shower, I'm reminded of the cancer. I just want to get on with life. And this is her perspective after reconstructive surgery. For example, reconstruction made me forget about the cancer. And I think we can all appreciate these sort of quotes are very powerful and informative, but alone they can't be used for measurement. And this is where the use of validated PROMs that were developed using the patient's own quotes have become a really valuable tool, tool for being able to quantify this information. So in 2009, the BreastQ PROM was developed uh, for this reason, to capture outcomes specific to reconstructive breast surgery. And the Flinders Breast Reconstruction Service was the first clinic in Australia to adopt this. And so the BreastQ captures quality of life domains, shown here in blue, and satisfaction domains, which have been shown in green. And integrating the breast queue in our service has enabled us to monitor patient outcomes, to identify patients with concerns early and to stimulate conversations between the clinician and patient, and also to fully inform new breast reconstruction patients by using a series of before and after photos combined with the patient reported breast queue scores. So here is an example which helps us to see the value of each step of a breast reconstruction. So you can see the satisfaction with breasts and psychosocial wellbeing scores increasing incrementally with each stage of a breast reconstruction following cancer treatment. And these are her scores in the remaining satisfaction domains which are um, scored postoperatively. And so we can see from the patient's perspective, she was actually very happy with the outcome of her reconstruction. We also use PROMS data to conduct uh, regular audits of the clinical management of our patients. 
And an example of this is from our hand surgery service where we've integrated the hand cue prom that was developed and validated by a unit and as part of an international collaboration to capture quality of life outcomes specific to hand surgery. And this graph shows the mean uh, pre and post-operative hand cue scores for the entire cohort. And so we can see that significant improvements were found in each of these domains. And we present this PROMS data as an entire cohort and also um, for patients who have recently completed treatment in combination with traditional outcome measures, such as number and type of procedures, waiting times, and surg surg surgical complications. And these are presented regularly at department meetings so that we can comprehensively audit the clinical management and outcomes of this patient group. And we also do this for the Flinders Breast Reconstruction Service. And we've also done this for the complex and multidisciplinary head and neck service at Flinders. We also use PROMS data to compare our outcomes to other organisations locally, nationally and internationally. An example of this is our involvement with the OECD Patient Reported Indicators Survey or PARIS initiative for breast cancer patient outcomes. So the aim of this initiative is to benchmark outcomes and experiences of healthcare that matter to people. And this project currently involves 23 countries with the aim of improving breast cancer care with PROMS. So our unit have contributed data representing outcomes from Australian women since this initiative first began in 2019. And this is just a screen grab from the first publication of Health at a Glance, where we've benchmarked our outcomes for breast reconstruction post mastectomy patients compared to other institutions across Europe, the United Kingdom and the United States. And we've continued this collaboration and have recently submitted data for the third round of this initiative. We also collect and interpret PROMS data for research purposes for the practice of evidence-based medicine. And one area that's been the focus for many of our research projects using PROMS data that's routinely collected is our breast reconstruction service. And I'd really like to acknowledge that a very important part of this research work in this area involves our breast reconstru reconstruction consumer research group. And we've worked with them in partnership for over eight years in developing new research ideas and for reviewing research activity and outputs. And their input and perspective has been really invaluable to our service and to our department as a whole. And these are just some examples of publications from research projects using this breast cue data. And most of these projects have looked at the impact of different aspects of a reconstruction on patients' outcomes. For example, looking at the type of reconstruction, uh, breast symmetry, the impact of complications, and also assessing outcomes by pa patient characteristics such as BMI and age. And another example of a research project um, that's currently being conducted by a unit along with two advanced studies medical students is related to surgery for skin cancer. So it's well known that Australia has one of the highest rates of skin cancer in the world and the incidence of both melanoma and non-melanoma skin cancer has significantly increased over the past few decades. And these cancers are frequently found on areas of the body that are repeatedly exposed to UV radiation, such as the face. But facial skin cancer surgery may result in prominent scarring and a change of appearance. So this study has aimed to gain a better understanding around the impact of facial skin cancer surgery on physical and psychosocial well-being and satisfaction with appearance using the FACEQ skin cancer prom. So this graph shows the FACEQ scales that are measured before and following surgery. And while this is only very preliminary data, you can see that overall surgery has significantly reduced cancer worry and appearance related distress and increased satisfaction with facial appearance in these patients. And postoperatively, we can see significant improvements over time in the appraisal of scars. So future directions for this research will include investigating how different clinical and patient factors affect outcomes following surgery, and it's anticipated that results from this research will provide really valuable insight for individualised preoperative counselling and improve postoperative support in this patient group. And lastly, we've used the collection of PROMS data for patient advocacy. And this has become really important in an era of increasingly tight healthcare budgets to provide high quality evidence to demonstrate the clinical effectiveness of reconstructive surgery procedures. 
And an example of this is a 12 year project that was conducted at Flinders Medical Center. and was actually part of um, my PhD, evaluating the health benefits of breast reduction surgery for the treatment of symptomatic breast hypertrophy. So breast hypertrophy can be a cause of considerable physical and psychosocial well-being and has a significant negative impact on quality of life. And although breast reduction surgery is known to be an effective treatment, it's often mistakenly thought of as a cosmetic procedure rather than a functional operation. And in many countries and jurisdictions where worldwide, there's, there has been an emerging theme on increasing restrictions and refusals on access to surgery. So in Australia, the, Medi the Medicare benefits schedule subsidises breast reduction undertaken in private hospitals, thereby recognising that it's a functional procedure that warrants funding. But when we looked at the Australian public hospitals, we found that there was inequitable access to surgery, where access for patients is ultimately reliant upon state and local policies. And in some states, uh, it is an excluded procedure, whilst in others, there are restrictions um, on things like body mass index. And these are often arbitrary uh, cutoffs that are not based on the evidence. So the aim of this study, therefore, was to provide high quality evidence using PROMS to demonstrate the effectiveness of surgery and advocate for this, condition, um, for this procedure to continue to be funded for Australian women. And so this radar plot shows the results of this study using the SF36 uh, generic PROM, which assesses eight different areas of quality of life. So in this sort of uh, chart, the closer you are to the middle, um, the worse your scores. And in red here, we can see SF36 scores from women in the general population. So in blue, this is women who had breast hypertrophy. And you can see that bodily pain was their most noticeable health problem. But you can also see that they had significantly worse scores um, when compared to women in the general population across all areas of health. And what was really interesting was that within three months of surgery, their scores had significantly improved to levels of uh, the normal population across all areas of health. And this improvement was sustained at six and 12 months. So results like this from this study showed that breast reduction surgery is very effective in removing the health problems associated with breast hypertrophy. And when we looked at the SF36 summary score for physical health, we found that breast reduction provided greater gain in physical health than other procedures such as the coronary artery bypass graft or incisional hernia repair. And the improvement in mental health uh, was double that of any of the other compared operations. So these uh, results demonstrated the clinical effectiveness of surgery, but we also wanted to determine whether this benefit occurred at a reasonable cost to, cost to the healthcare system. And so we conducted a cost utility analysis, again, using the SF36 PROMS data to calculate quality adjusted life years gained or qualies, which is a measure that combines both um, the quality and the quantity of life in a single index. And we subsequently used this to calculate the cost per quality gain. So this figure is a comparison of the cost per quality gain between breast reduction and, other, and medical interventions for other chronic health conditions. So you can see here that we've demonstrated that the cost per quality for breast reduction compares favorably with the other medical interventions, which are widely accepted in the Australian healthcare system. And it was also considerably lower than implicit uh, cost effectiveness thresholds. And so we were able to show that breast reduction for women with symptomatic breast hypertrophy is cost effective in the Australian context. So this research provides the high quality evidence to demonstrate both the clinical and cost effectiveness of surgery. And this was used to successfully inform state and national healthcare policy and circumvent the loss of this important surgical procedure for women in the Australian Medicare system. So in summary, while there have been many challenges and barriers to integrating PROMS into clinical care in our unit, there have been many benefits uh, for enhancing patient-centered care that I think can be applied across many specialties, uh, for allowing patients to feel empowered in shared decision-making, for helping patients make informed choices about their treatment, for giving clinicians a better understanding of the health impact of a disease or condition, and a better understanding of the impact of a surgery or treatment on patients' lives, and for providing evidence to evaluate standards of practice, to drive quality improvement and obtain better outcomes for patients. And I'd like to thank the long list of people at Flinders Medical Centre who have been involved in implementing PROMS in our service. Thank you. Oh, great. 
That was excellent. Thanks, Tamara. It was great to see all the different areas you're utilising proms in. And I really liked that breast reduction um, example. It's such a great, easy to follow example of how collecting data from patients can be used as an evidence base to help shift in policy. So that was really great. Thank you. And I think now Renee and Wendy are in the room. Yes. Hello. We can see you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Apologies for the delay, but we're finally here. So hi, everyone. I'm Wendy. Hi, I'm Renee. Um, and we'll just go to share our screen. Yes, please do. Oh, and thank you, Tamara, for jumping in. That's greatly appreciated. <laughs> yes, thank you, Tamara. Please give us a hoi when you can see that. Perfect. Thank you. Sorry, we haven't got around to introducing you, but I'll just hand it over to you and um, we'll go from here. Thank you. Sure. No worries. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, so I'm Wendy Saunders. I'm the Integration Manager here at the Adelaide Primary Health Network. And I'm Renee Taylor, an Integration Coordinator working in the Salem region. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> we will get there. Doesn't want to move. There we Excellent. We, uh, we would also like to acknowledge the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of the LA region and pay tribute to their physical and spiritual connection to land, waters and community, enduring now as it has been throughout time, and pay respect to them and their cultures, culture and elders past and present. Um, so we're obviously here talking about PRIMS in action today, but a bit of an overview as to who the Adelaide Primary Health Network is, because some of you might not know who we are. Um, so we are uh, funded by the federal government um, and have been around for, we're heading into our um, eighth year. Uh, and we're here to look at improving health outcomes and the experience for primary health care within the Adelaide metro region. Um, there are 31 of us around the country and there's two of us here in South Australia. So we're the Adelaide site and then there's our um, country colleagues. Um, um, and we are we work with the wider community and primary care providers, I guess, to make uh, try and make the health system a wee bit better for um, where people's needs are at. And the diagram you can see on the right hand side is our commissioning life cycle. So we obviously engage community and stakeholders uh, with regards to our needs assessment, which identifies where the gaps are. Then we go through the cycle from the right through design, procurement, um, administering contracts, then monitoring and evaluating those, and then the cycle starts again. So this gives you a bit of an idea as to our region. So we've got 1.2 million people um, across the Adelaide, um, sorry, across uh, South Australia. Our region is from Anglevale to Selix Beach. So it's quite um, a large area. Uh, and there are listed on the left-hand side, the seven national areas of focus for all primary health networks. We also have some local areas that we um, focus on and they're identified through our needs assessment and then considered and reflected in the work that we do. And some examples of that are, uh, we've got some programs for cold communities and for children and youth. My turn. Um, so this slide shows you that some of the common terms that we'll be using throughout our presentation. And you'll probably note that we move from PREM to PRUM and quite deliberately. And we have also included this as a helpful cheat sheet in our PRUM's guidance. Um, this is to ensure that we are all using consistent language and internally and with the services we commission. Okay, now I'll give you a bit of history as to our journey with um, PRIMS. Um, to date, there hasn't been um, any requirement for primary health networks to measure people's experiences of service they are funding. Um, but as a PHM, we made a, a decision quite early on to include this as a contractual obligation for all our commission services. And um, if I use the word CSP, I'm talking about a commission service provider, and we provided them with a, uh, with a PREM. Um, we required at that time and continue to require all our CSPs to offer the PRUM to 100% of people who attend their service. Um, it is worth noting that the Commonwealth Government recently announced that reporting on PRUMs would be a new requirement for PHNs, so we're on the front foot, which is great. Um, fast forward to 2020. Um, the organisation was really starting to focus more on integration and integrated care and exploring how we would measure that. 
and um, we established an internal steering group to look at how we could measure integration from both internally and externally. Um, and through that piece of work, we did develop some integrated care indicators to help us measure how we're doing in that space. Um, through that activity, that's how we landed on looking at our PREMS, because we soon found that they were very central to measuring integration and integrated care, and that um, they were, in fact, a data source for 35% of the integrated care indicators that we came up with. So it was a great opportunity to then reflect and see if they were fit for purpose. Um, and we put to our executive a proposal to review and they were supportive of that. And so we um, went away with developing and documenting a PROMS process, which we'll talk to you more about, and identifying a, an appropriate tool for administering the PROMS. So as Renee has mentioned, um, we were looking for uh, something that was going to be consistently person-centred, and I think Tamara mentioned that in her presentation as well, that we wanted a person-centred approach to the tool that we were using. We wanted to ensure that it was easy for the person that was actually receiving the service in order to complete it, and also for our commission service providers, we, we needed to make sure that it was an easy tool for them to administer, and then obviously to analyse the data at the back end and then to try and generate, I guess, quality improvement activities that could uh, make a difference to the service that they were providing. And the reason that we did this is because, um, as Renee mentioned, we obviously um, encouraged all of our commission service providers to offer 100% of people that attended their service a PREM. We realised that there were about 19 different variations of our PREM out there. So there was nothing consistent that was being measured that we could reflect on internally. They weren't necessarily person-centred because in some instances, some commission service providers indicated that they had their own survey and they would prefer to use that. Uh, so in some cases, people were completing two PREMs, which certainly wasn't uh, person-centred. They were telling their story more than once. Uh, and then there was no consistency with regards to uh, measuring PROMs. Uh, there were a few questions in there that could have alluded to it being a PROM. Um, but yeah, I think as a result of reviewing this, we decided that it was um, necessary to, to make some vast improvements there. We, so we did a bit of an environmental scan before we um, started on our journey. Uh, so we surveyed some of our um, commission service providers to gather their thoughts on what they, um, they've, how they found our current prim, uh, a with the process and also with the questions that were being asked. And their feedback was used um, as part of our prim's refresh. We also looked more broadly, so the PHNs have a national SharePoint site, um, and so we put a question out on that to see if there was any other primary health network that was doing some work in the PREMS or the PROM space. Uh, we got um, some information from the uh, Western Australian Primary Health Alliance that they were doing a refresh on their PREMS as well, so we had a conversation with them, uh, but it looked like we were probably a little bit more advanced than they were. Um, and then we met with the Commission on Excellence and Innovation in Healthcare because we knew that they were doing the statewide refresh for PREMS and PROMS. So we had a conversation with Megan and her colleagues about that. They indicated that their first cab off the rank was going to be reviewing PROMS, but they very kindly shared the service specifications for their platform because they were going out to market for that. And that, I guess, assisted us in thinking about what our, um, I guess, how we were going to record and report on PREMS moving forward. So that was certainly a helpful conversation. When we were developing our new PRIM, um, we looked at a couple of validated tools that were already out there. So there was the Yes PHN survey and the CARE survey, and we took the both of them and I guess combined a number of the questions or areas um, into our current PRIM. And we also acknowledged that we didn't necessarily want the questions to be the main reason or the main focus when we were reviewing what people's um, report, I guess, was or feedback on how they um, found the service, we decided that we wanted them to, uh, the questions to align to various domains. So we came up with six domains that you can see on the right hand side that reference the service being welcoming, safe, respectful, obviously involving the participant or the person attending that service in uh, what their care needs are, um, their access to other information and then that continuity of care. Um, and so this was the way that we developed our new prep, um, and we've got some examples of what those questions look like. 
Okay, to, to continue with the development of the PRIM, we also set up two um, action groups. These were time, li time limited and were focused on workflow and guidance and the documentation associated with that, as well as platform specification and data collection. So really helping us to understand what was the best tool, what, how would we present information in a de-identified way to support quality improvement activities, um, we also invited our community advisory council members to review and test the survey and provide feedback and um, really get their thoughts on the ease of completing it. Did they have a preference to a smiley face rating scale versus a number rating scale? And um, the feedback received was largely positive and provided helpful suggestions on some rewording of questions. And um, the smiley face rating scale was uh, seen to be the best the best scale to use. Um, in addition, we also asked one of our commission services to look at guidance material and um, have a bit of a play around and test the test the platform for us. So this is the survey, and um, as Wendy mentioned, it was created using two validated tools. Um, it's really worth noting that all questions are optional for respondents to complete, and it takes about two minutes. So these are the demographic questions. We have three focused on language, gender and identifying as Aboriginal or and or Torres Strait Islander. And we also have a FAQ document that supports people when completing the survey that explains what will happen to their feedback, how it will be combined, you know, for their, that service to look at how they can make quality improvements. And um, we also felt it was really important that if someone had more of a complaint or they really wanted to get some feedback on their own feedback, that there were other mechanisms to go about this as this was an anonymous survey. So we made sure that we included that information as well. Uh, these are the nine questions that we um, directly relate to the domains that Wendy talked about on the earlier slide, along with an additional comments box. Um, as you can see, you know, I feel trust and confidence in the service I receive is related to the safety domain. Being involved in making decisions as I want it, as much as I want it to be is like the involvement domain. Um, the improvements question, things I'd like to see improvements with, question number nine is about access, not surprisingly. Um, transport and time for appointment and stuff is features quite highly, but we'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and the additional comments box has been containing a lot of really rich data to um, provide more context to the participants' feedback. So after all that work, we were ready to launch um, in May last year. Um, so at this stage, all of our commission service providers, except for two, are using the Adelaide Preferred PHN PRIM. Um, they all have access to a Power BI dashboard, which we'll show you in a minute, um, which provides our um, capacity building coordinators that are aligned with every contract that we administer to have discussions with CSPs about quality improvement activities based on, in most instances, about the free text comments that are made throughout the PRIM. Uh, as a result of COVID, bless COVID, uh, we have a QR code system, which makes it really easy for individuals to just scan and then it takes them straight through to the survey, as well as an SMS um, texting uh, system as well. Uh, so it's easy administration for the service provider if someone's not scanned the code before they've left their service. Um, Click Dimensions is the platform that we've used to administer the survey. And the frequency for administration is really determined by the CSP. Um, some will find that they will offer the survey when a person's um, leaving the service after one service. Others will find if there's a series of treatment services, it might be at the very end of that treatment service. We've got some providers that pick a particular month and just send out the SMS to anyone that's attended that service within that month. Um, others do it every Monday. So there's a range of different ways that people will administer it. And that certainly then is reflected on the dashboard that provides the results. So this gives you a bit of an idea as to what our dashboard looks like. So all of our commission service providers have access to this. Obviously, they only have access to their data. We have access to the, the full suite of data. So this is the front, front page that's seen. So on the far right hand side, you can see a green rainbow there that provides us with, on average, what the overall score is for all of the questions asked 
And I have to say that since we've been, we've had the dashboard available, um, that it has sat in and around the 4.5 um, experience rate, which is uh, pretty high, it's out of five. So that's very encouraging. To date, we've had um, 1,172 submissions, because remember, this is up to the individual if they want to complete it, even though it's offered to 100% of participants. And our survey has a 98% completion rate, meaning that of all the questions that are asked, 98% of it is completed. Um, the donut with all the multiple colours in the middle is um, they're basically the various commission services that we provide or um, commission. So there's mental health services in there, there's alcohol and other drug services, there's um, integrated teen care, which is the old close the gap service, and they've all got a colour coded kind of section on that pie. Um, and obviously we commission more services in the primary mental health care space and AOD space, hence why the purple and navy blue sections seem to have more uh, responses. The submissions by year, quarter and month below um, show the variability as I was talking about and that probably is as a result of the frequency in which the survey is being administered by our Commission service providers. Um, but you can see that we do get quite, well we think that they're quite good <laughs> responses. Um, Obviously, we uh, pulled that report in preparation for this presentation uh, sort of mid to late June. So those numbers potentially were higher for the month of June. And then the bigger chart on the right hand side references the questions that Renee just showed on the survey before. And I guess the, the percentage of uh, responses to that. The demographic question around Aboriginal and or Torres Strait Islander is probably the lowest one. We do have some services that are for cold communities only. So therefore that question would be not required to be um, answered. And the other questions that we find are probably the lowest are uh, in regard to continuity. And often um, we have that conversation with our CSPs is once someone's finished with their service, is there clear communication around what the next steps are for that person? Is there any on referring that's required and are they aware of that? The second page of our dashboard drills down a little bit further where it brings up all the information about the various genders and Indigenous identifier that um, people have responded to uh, and then also includes the number of or this, the main language spoken by the person that's completing the survey. The big table at the top that's got a lot of darker green and lighter green is all the questions in relation to the six domains that we mentioned before and you can see that Primarily, people strongly agree that they felt welcomed, safe, respected, etc. And as I mentioned before, the continuity questions to the far right of that table have a few more yellows, which is unsure, or oranges and reds, which is um, disagree or strongly disagree. Um, and then you can see that we've also got the uh, areas for improvement, as Renee mentioned. Um, we provide some options here. There are some things that obviously we have no control over, nor do our commission service providers, but it provides good intel for us moving forward when we are commissioning to consider some of the thoughts that have been shared by participants. Um, you know, transport, do we need to be more mindful about making sure that our commission service providers are located near public transport? You know, what are the wait times? You know, have they blown out? Is that a conversation for the CBC to have with their commission service provider, et cetera? And the additional comments section, which we pixelated, that's where the rich information comes that we can certainly share with our providers to make improvements to their service. Um, so this is a bit about where we're at now. So after a year of the new from being administered, we, we continue to build upon where we started and we have an internal working group that is focused on quality improvement, um, we have six monthly reviews as a working group. We have developed an e-form for onboarding our commission service providers. So as new providers um, are funded or providers are decommissioned, we have a process which is very much supported by our IT team. Um, we've published our PRUMS guidance on our Confluence space, and this enables real-time guidance to be available, and we can update it quickly and com communicate those changes to CSPs and staff. We have um, we want our PRUM to be as accessible as possible, and we have recently had it translated into 20 other community languages. Um, we are just finalising the tech that supports this at the back end and hope to go live very soon with this. And uh, we're also working with our Aboriginal Health League to scope um, offering the PRUM in First Nations languages and how best to engage um, with the community on this and we'll also be sure to uh, reach out to the presenters from last week's presentation. Um, yeah, so that is where we are at as an organisation.
Great. Thank you so much, Wendy and Renee. Um, congrats on the 98% completion rate and such a high satisfaction rate. That, that's really great to see. Uh, I really liked seeing the background or the journey as to how you got where you did with the development of your PRIMS. And um, the screenshot of the survey, I think, would be quite useful for those who are new in the space. So thank you for that. Let me just quickly share my screen. Oh, here you go. Okay, we'll, we'll go to you then, um, Claudia. Sorry, do you want me to un unshare? That's all right. Go okay. for it. Please. Thanks. Thanks, Claudia. <laughs> okay, sorry. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and hi, everyone. My name's Claudia Verdon. I'm a palliative care nurse by background um, and I'm working now as a senior research fellow for uh, uh, the Cancer and Palliative Care Outcomes Centre at the Queensland University of Technology. And I really want to say thank you for letting me come and talk this afternoon um, about a study that we're running at the moment, which really does um, hopefully provide a, an example of PREMS in action. Um, it's called the PREM Qual Study. Sarah, that looks okay on screen, does it? Yep, great. Um, and so the, the longer title of the study is Improving the Quality of Hospital Care for People with Serious Illness Through Patient Experience Measurement and Feedback, Informing Facilitated Ward-Based Improvement and Implementation Pilot Study. So it's a long uh, title, hence we call it the Prem Qual Study. Um, it's, we're running it with um, support via Queensland University of Technology, Metro North Hospital and Health Service and also Queensland Health and working here at the Royal Brisbane and Women's Hospital. Um, and as, I'll just see if that'll move now, as others have, I also wanted to um, acknowledge uh, the First Nations owners of the lands where we, we stand today. So I'm up in Brisbane, which are the lands of the Turbul and Yugara people, and we pay respect to their elders, laws, customs, and creation spirits. And we recognize that these lands have always been places of teaching, research, and learning. And we acknowledge the important uh, role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play within the QUT community. And I certainly acknowledge at the outset too that a lot of the work I'm leading around PREMS in palliative care um, is mostly um, based on perspectives from non-Aboriginal people. And I think it's a really important area of research for us to understand how some of these PREM tools for people with palliative care needs uh, work within um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspectives and different ways of knowing, being and doing. I also wanted to acknowledge at the outset that a lot of the work that I'm presenting on today, I, I don't have a long period of time, so I'm providing sort of a snapshot of this particular project, but it, it's really informed by my doctoral research, who was, you know, hugely supported by my PhD supervision panel, who you can see there on the left. Um, and in in addition to those four people, um, throughout my PhD, I had a lot of input from consumer representatives, participating hospitals, clinicians, patients and family members, policy makers, so many people that have really collectively provided their wisdom to the work um, that I'm presenting today. And throughout my postdoctoral work that I'm doing now, uh, I really uh, wanted to acknowledge the cancer care services and the internal medicine services here at the Royal Brisbane Hospital who've been so supportive um, of my work on their wards and, and our learning together. And, and again, consumer representatives who've continued to inform all of our thinking. So I guess just a little bit of context, and I'm really grateful to the two presentations prior to me who, for the um, really the good definitions already provided around PREMS and PROMS and PRIMS as such. And so I won't necessarily go into them in my 15 minutes, but I guess, why did I wanna look at PREMS specifically for people with palliative care needs? Um, and like the others have also said, person-centered care is a real driver for quality palliative care. And that was certainly a, a large factor that we found in my PhD that people feel safe when they have um, the ad an adequate environment, good person-centered care, as well as good expert and competent care. And what I wanted to know in terms of measurement was would a broader PREM that we're using quite um, in a lot of different areas of healthcare work for people with palliative care needs, or do we need to look at a tailored PREM for that particular patient group? I looked at the inpatient space, the hospital space, because we know at present in Australia, most people with palliative care needs will die in hospital and most will require at least one, if not more, hospital admissions in the last year of life. We also know that for over 30 years, patients and families have consistently told us about the type of inpatient palliative care that, that helps them feel safe and well cared for. 
We also know that providing optimal palliative care in an environment which is designed for acute episodic care is really challenging. Um, we know that PREMS are one way to monitor care quality um, and a, a pr previous uh, presenter talked about some of the measures that we use for quality don't always speak to what patients and families might tell us really makes a difference for them and I, I want to sort of really explore that further. But it's really unclear which PREM to use for this patient group or how to administer them in a way that the patient um, feels safe to do so. So I guess I wanted to understand three areas. So what tools exist? What do patients, families and clinicians think about some of those tools? And then how can using those tools support innovation and change? And I don't have time today to talk to you about the first two um, steps, but um, I can certainly refer you to the fact we have done a systematic review about tools that are available, PREMS available for people um, who are in hospital with palliative care needs. And we've also um, published on two different aspects of what patients and families think um, and clinicians think about these tools. And all of that work has informed which tool we've chosen to test in the current study that I'm presenting today. And what we learned from the earlier studies was um, that a brief PREM tailored to the needs of inpatients with palliative care needs is acceptable. And on the whole, patients did want um, a tailored PREM to their needs. They talked about needing um, PREMs to be a bit more in tune with what their particular needs were at this time of their life. That we need to think about families' needs as in a separate way to, to the patient's needs. So not as just a proxy measure, but actually also look at what are the family's needs when we're considering palliative care. Who to administer these PREMs and how often is still not clear and an area for future research. And we should also be thinking about the local context and the reason for using the actual PREM um, to, to make sure it's meeting the needs of patients, families and clinicians and is then also charged to enable actionable change. So if we're thinking about the fact that really we know we need to have the PREM to be quite brief, um, sometimes a brief screener can work for a clinical environment, but sometimes if they just want to focus, for example, on communication, they might want a PREM that's very focused on communication and predominantly provides um, questions in relation to communication to drive their improvement. We know that there are 44 PREMs available for inpatient palliative care, um, and so it's always helpful to leverage off work that has already been completed. But as I'm grappling with this, I'm also starting to wonder whether just the actual um, use of PREMs in itself is a therapeutic intervention. And I'm saying that because recently I went to see uh, a man and um, he was on a ward and I completed the PREM with him. Um, and I came back a few days later and he deteriorated significantly and was now dying on the ward. Um, and as I went into the ward, his, his face really lit up and he said with a, you know, a big smile, hey, survey girl, come and sit down and let's chat. Um, and he was then too unwell. He sort of went back to sleep and couldn't complete the survey. But his son came over and said, dad hasn't been that animated all day. What is it about your survey? And that really made me start to sort of reflect on what is it about the act of actually asking people about what they think about their care quality and is, is in itself that quite therapeutic. Um, this is the survey that we're using, and I don't have time to really go through all of the background as to how we got here, but this, we did provide different surveys for patients and families to look at. Um, and this is the one we've settled on, and we've settled on it for a number of reasons. Firstly, um, it's only seven questions, um, so it's brief. Secondly, it is directly mapped to areas that patients and families have said is important for quality care for people with palliative care needs. And so the very beginning of my PhD, um, the first part was me doing a systematic review, looking at uh, what is important for patients and families in the hospital setting. And the team, Saunders et al from the US picked up the domains of importance from my systematic review and then started with, unbeknownst to me, started to work with um, patients to say, if we know this is important, how could we start to ask about this? And that's how they actually developed this particular tool called Considerate. Um, so we liked that it was mapped to what was important and made a difference from a patient and family perspective. We liked that it was only seven questions. And we also liked that the, the terminology or the language used um, is very much targeted at the right, like it's um, 
good for people with a variance of, of language literacy. So it's quite simple language, which is quite accessible for the majority of the population. And so for all those reasons, we chose this. Um, and what we wanted to do was to start understanding whether this considerate tool can um, support innovation and change. And that's what brought us to the study that I mentioned earlier, which has four key objectives. So we're wanting to understand the key enablers, both personal and contextual, for improving inpatient palliative care provision at the ward level. We want to co-design and pilot test pragmatic and innovative solutions to affect sustainable changes in care delivery for people with serious illness in the inpatient setting. We want to evaluate the feasibility, acceptability and resource requirements of measuring patient experience data and using feedback in facilitated ward-based improvement in care for inpatients with complex and serious illness. And we want to explore the potential impact of this on the quality and safety of inpatients with palliative care needs in alignment with the Commission's national guidance and accreditation standards. And this is a three phase study. So the first phase is really just trying to develop an understanding of the context we're working with. So I'm working within three different wards, um, a cancer care ward, an internal medicine ward with a specialist um, focus on respiratory and an internal medicine ward with a specialist focus on renal care. Um, and so initially in phase one, I did, did some clinician interviews across medicine, nursing and allied health. So about 30 interviews. And throughout that time, we also did the PREM collection with um, patients. So we, we collected 40 um, of those considerate surveys. And then we brought all of that data together um, into what we called a co-design data pack. And we presented it back to the clinical team and said, this is what we've learned about from a clinician perspective and also from a patient and family perspective, mostly patient perspective. Um, and we asked them to reflect on that information and reflect on what made them proud in the data and what made them feel uncomfortable. And then over a couple of meetings, we worked with the areas that they were uncomfortable about in the care um, feedback uh, to really guide the focus area for us to work with in phase two. We're currently working in phase two across the three wards where they're sort of working together with a small multidisciplinary working group. We meet weekly and they talk about what they want to do and how to take that forward. And I do some facilitation and support. As we're doing that, we're continuing to collect PREMS and continually continuing to feed that data back um, at different time points to try and help the clinicians to consistently be focused on what the patients are saying about the care quality and try to amplify the patient voice ongoingly. And then the third phase is about understanding the acceptability of this from a clinician perspective. We really want to understand whether using PREMS in practice um, actually does help them in understanding their care delivery and where they might want to shift and change. Just um, briefly, so, and this is false data because I haven't yet um, completed all the data analysis for the project, which is still underway. But this is the sort of style of data feedback that we provide for, uh, for the wards. So we, we can show them the responses of very good, good, bad, very bad, and doesn't apply um, according to all of the different questions on the tool. Um, and as previous presenters have also noted, the free text that is available per question has been critical uh, for all of the work throughout. It provides a real richness and story to why some people might feel that they need more information or, or what what specifically around the environment they wish would, was different as such. And you can also pull the data out per question and actually sort of dive into the data a little bit more and understand frequency of responses per rating or indeed, and this has been what the clinicians have really engaged with most, is where we've created a running chart according to a time, the time points where you create a percentage based on the, you can see the rating score at the very top. So the very good gets six points, exact, um, et cetera. And you, you create an overall percentage. The wards, uh, one of the wards said, we thought that the benchmark should be at about 70%. And so they have been working with understanding their data um, in this run chart format. And it really does drive really good conversations and some really nice competition between the, uh, the wards as well, which they've, they've enjoyed. So in terms of where the wards have chosen to focus their efforts, it has been guided by the PREM data and we have allowed each ward to work with what they are charged to work with at this time, reflecting the data and also their local context. 
So the Cancer Care Ward really wanted to look at information provision about sort of prognosis and expectations over the year ahead. Um, the respiratory and general medical ward really wanted to look at screening for critically unwell people who are potentially going to die in the next three months to um, instigate proactive planning information and ensure that um, goals of care are really identified. And the uh, general medicine and renal ward are wanting to better implement specific supports around the terminally ill patient on their ward, the dying patient on their ward. And they've all got different um, details related to all of those interventions that we're testing at the moment. So what I would say is that the work in itself is quite messy in terms of the support. Each ward has different needs and requirements. There's all the different requirements for rotational medicine, nursing, um, allied health, how to get the communication working well across all of those um, different groups is, is hard, but it's been really important and a really I've really enjoyed this, this study. Uh, I feel like we're doing really quite practical and meaningful work. And I really feel that the PREMS have been an important part of that. In fact, the real conversation starter and the clinicians have really engaged very specifically with the data and been really quite receptive to it, um, particularly the, the free text quotes, as I said earlier. So I'm really I'm aware that that was like a whistle top tour, but I'm happy to take questions at any time or if take emails down the track as well. Thanks, Sarah. Oh, great. Thanks, Claudia. Um, I really liked when you were saying about looking at the patient's care and also what the families need and how they can be very different things. Um, I really like the example of the elderly man who was calling someone survey girl. <laughs> and the passion towards this area really came out. So thank you so much for that. We're almost at time, but there is one question in the Q&A. So I'll go to that. And this was for Renee and Wendy. Um, they, the person said, fabulous example of PREMS in action. And um, do the organisations get a view that ranks them against organisations to benchmark? So this would be that, that dashboard. And also can providers drill down and see how particular cohorts rate them? For example, cold, Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islanders, et cetera. Okay, so in response to the first part of that question, um, at this point in time, they only get to see their own data. Um, so we obviously as the PHN get to see all PRIMS data that's reported on the dashboard. Whether moving forward, we bundle up some, you know, just some of the higher level information and we share with similar services like our mental health services, that could be for consideration. So a great suggestion, whoever threw that out on the questions. Um, and then drilling down into um, specific cohorts, the survey probably doesn't enable that at this point in time. Uh, there is... I guess little functionality for the provider to drill into that level of detail. Um, I'm not even sure that we would be able to do that at the back end. Um, so I would say possibly not. Yeah, the, we could look at by language. So like the way you slice and dice in Power BI might allow you to look at the people that um, speak a particular language and what their responses are. Um, or people, you know, females or males or, you know, other genders. We could slice and dice that way. But, yeah, that would be the limit. Okay, great. Thank you. And I'm sorry, everyone, if there were more questions. We're just out of time. Um, but I just want to thank all four of you for your fabulous presentations. I know seeing the practical implementation of PREMS, PROMS, PREMS it is really beneficial for people learning. And so this, this webinar concludes the Spotlight series on patient reported measures. And this one and others will be uploaded. Well, the others are already on our website, but this one will be uploaded too. So I just want to thank everyone again and thank you for tuning in.